Good morning, Oak Hill Church. I invite you to stand your feet as we worship our King this morning. We're going to sing of his many names this morning to give him praise for all he's done for us. Sing this out. I call you maker. I call you Life in eternal spark, I call you healer. You can mend any broken heart, I call you faithful father. You finish everything you start, my soul was made to respond. Sing this out a thousand names. I know you by a thousand names.
thank you for worshiping with us. As you're being seated, turn around to someone around you. Just let them know you're glad to see you here this morning. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Oak Hills Church. We are so glad to have you here today, whether you are here in person with us or you are joining us online. For those who don't know me, my name is Brian. I get to serve here as the worship pastor at Oak Hills. And it's always a joy to come together as believers and be able to just sing praises to our God and lift up our voices for all he's done for us. If you are new around here, special welcome to you. I'm glad to have you here today. Uh, one thing I want to invite you to do is connect with us. And there's a couple of easy ways you can do this. You can fill out a little code or you can scan that code and fill out a little form that we have on our website. Scan that code will take you to a little list of things. If you press connect, it just gives us a little bit of information about you so we can know about you a little bit and how we can serve you best. I just invite you to do that. If you fill out that code or fill out that form, if you stop by the welcome desk on the way out today, we have a little gift for you just in exchange for being here today and worshiping with us and just filling out that form. So fill that out and stop by the welcome desk on your way out today. And one thing I want to point to that's also on that code is a little tab that says next steps. And this is something we want to continue to point to as a church. We want to constantly be taking next steps. We don't want to become complacent, but instead take the next step to further our faith and just get more involved. You click on that, there's a number of different next steps you can take. There's things like baptism, baby dedications, coming to Life Track where you learn about our church. You can find an opportunity to serve, find a place to plug in. But the one I really want to focus on today is hope groups. We have opportunities, these are the small groups that meet where we spur one another on in our faith. We grow in our faith and grow in our knowledge of the Bible. And this is an opportunity to create friendships and relationships, but they're really centered around a life that's lived for Christ. We have groups that meet on Sunday nights at 6 and on Wednesday nights at 6.30 and even a group that meets Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock now. So I challenge you, if you have not gone to a hope group before, to just take the opportunity to get plugged in one, to try one out and see what it's like. And maybe you're thinking today, I have no idea where to start with this. I don't know what groups are my age or how to even begin this process. If you go to that form uh, under next steps that says hope groups, you can fill out a little information um, about your availability, your age range, stuff like that. And we can get back to you that way. But another thing I can do is if you go to the welcome desk on your way out today, we'll have Kinsley, our next steps director. She'll be there. Any questions you have about hope groups, how to plug in, she'll point you in the right direction, get you in contact with the hope group, or at least let you know times that are available to you. And as we head back into a time of worship this morning, I want to read this passage from Acts 4, and it says this. And this is when Peter and John are before the council, and they're talking, they're being brought in and being condemned by them for preaching the word of Jesus. And it says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to the crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I invite you to stand back to your feet as we sing and just give praises to our cornerstone this morning. Holy trust in Jesus' name. 
Christ alone. Christ alone.
Oak Hills Church. Glad you are here today. Um, okay, so the other day, uh, I, uh, I decided to look up what do Americans value. Just Googled what do Americans value. And I was surprised to learn uh, very quickly that the very top response uh, was from the U.S. State Department. Didn't expect that, uh, but that America was going to tell me what America values. I'm going to move this back just a little bit right here. Um, but it said, a, I gave a different list, some different things that Americans value. And I think for the most part, uh, you'll probably agree with the vast majority of this list, okay? So it, it said that we value our independence. And of course we do. We're Americans, right? We value our independence. Uh, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. Uh, we want to live free and, and live in an independent way. So we value independence. All right, another one is we value equality, right? We all want equal uh, opportunity and equal say. We, we, we want to have equal rights, like that's a, a value of our country. I don't think we would disagree with that in any capacity. Uh, we also value individualism, right? Individualism is basically this idea, you get to do what you want, just don't hurt anybody, all right? And so I think you would agree yeah, our nation definitely values individualism, right? Another one, oh, we value democracy, right? We are Americans. We value democracy. We want to have that, that equal say, and we want to live in a free, free land. Another one uh, that it said from the U.S. State Department, patriotism, right? That Americans value patriotism. Now, we might have different degrees and different ways in which that they look, but, but according to the U.S. State Department, we value our country. We're proud of our country in different capacities, all right? Another one is... Uh, meritocracy, all right? Meritocracy, big fancy word for basically, um, we believe in, in working your way up, right? To working your way up to success by hard work, determination, based upon our merit, right? We succeed based upon our merit. Uh, another one, there's a few more. Another one is directness. Now, they did not ask me this, and they didn't ask any of you uh, that are like, like your non-confrontational people, um, but they value directness, all right, being direct. And based upon the emails I get occasionally, so do some of you. You value <laughs> directness. Um, and so we can't really disagree with that one, okay? Uh, innovation, right? We would agree with this. We, we want to create things. We, wanna, we want new things. We want better things. We're constantly trying to improve as a society, right? And so we value innovation, all right? Uh, let's see, two, three more. We value consumerism. Raise your hand if you like to shop. 
right? Like, and, and raise your hand if you like to shop for yourself. Like, I, I hate shopping. I love shopping for myself, particular with gift cards, right? Like, if I got gift cards and I don't have to spend my own money, uh, man, I love, I love shopping, all right? Um, informality, all right? They, they, we value informality. What they mean by this is we're not an overly formal culture, all right? They, they, they talk about that, that we move quickly in conversation from, um, excuse me, sir, to, excuse me, Charles, right? Like, like we move quickly out of that sir, that formality, uh, and we move into an informal, right? Your preacher is wearing tennis shoes, right? And so we're an informal, informal society, right? And the last one, and my favorite one, is the efficient use of time. This is so overwhelmingly important. Raise your hand if you're like, amen, brother. You got to use that time wisely. And, and raise your hand if you're like, who cares about using your time wisely? Just live, man, right? And so some of us are that way. Okay, so we have different lists. These are the, the values of Americans, all right? Now, we, we look at this list, and, and, and we have different degrees of different things, but I think overall, we would agree with this. Like, yeah, we, we, we value these things. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's like, like, man, you just seeing that of, uh, of, of the, the things that our country values, maybe it makes you proud to be an American. Like, yeah, we, we get to have those things. We get to live like that. Today, I want to introduce you. I want to talk about a completely different value system, a value system that is upside down, a value system that looks nothing like this. And it just so happens that it's the value system of the kingdom of heaven. And if it's the value system of the kingdom of heaven, it's the value system of the disciple, right? Over the past few weeks, we've been in this series all in. Where we're, we're becoming disciples of Jesus, right? We're answering that call. We're realizing there's a cost to discipleship, right? We understand that our call is not to just sit in a seat at 1030, but to live boldly for Jesus all through our life. And today I want to draw your attention to the kingdom values, the upside-down values of the kingdom of heaven. To find that out, I want you to grab your Bibles or get your version notes out. Grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. All right, Matthew chapter 5. If you have your physical Bible, and I encourage you to bring that because it's great for underlying, underlining some things, making some notes uh, to, to jar your memory later on when you read that. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1. All right, this is the beginning of the most famous sermon in human history, the Sermon on the Mount, okay? So the very first part of the Sermon on the Mount are what's called, we, we know of as the Beatitudes, all right? Here's the list. All right, we've got, got a few things. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they'll be what? Comforted. comforted. All right. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will what? Inherit. Inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. See how this starts to look really different? These lists are already looking very, very different. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. All right. So this value system continues to look distant or, or different. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This seems completely different if you really start to think about it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see what? Who? They will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? For they will be called sons of God, right? The peacemakers. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of me. Right? Blessed are the persecuted for, because of the righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? The persecuted. Think about these lists. Right? These lists look, look nothing alike. Like one value is like, like working your way up and one value is like, like working for God and pursuing righteousness. One tells you to be direct and one tells you to be meek. Right? These, are, these are upside down. One tells you to be devoted to country. And the other one says, be devoted to Savior. Right? These are upside down. These are very, very different. These two lists represent two completely different value systems. And if we're going to be honest, and let's just be, be, be completely honest with one another, one of these seems normal and one seems weird. 
just, it's, it's a little odd. We're supposed to value these things. One seems normal. This is normal. Some seem a little weird. And if we're going to be really honest, one of these lists seems like how we can improve at our jobs, how we can have a beautiful home, and just have a wonderful life and carry out the American dream, right? That's what that looks like. The other one doesn't seem concerned about the American dream at all. These are two very, very different value systems. And so what I want to do today, I want to just take today to kind of dive into each one of these. We're not going to spend a long time on each one, some a little longer than others, some we're just going to fly right past, uh, right, right through. Uh, but I want us to, to dive deep into these eight values to see if there's maybe a value system that we are off on. Maybe a value system if we're pursuing the life of a disciple and we're supposed to have the value systems of the kingdom of heaven. Is there one of these that we're a little off? And so some of these you, you may be going in the right direction and some of these you may really be struggling in. So let's dive in uh, and let's go one at a time, all right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, right out of the gate, right, like, this feels odd because this list has nothing to do with blessed are the poor anything, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means to be humble, to showcase humility. Not a false sense of humility, but rather the correct view of oneself. Romans 12, 3 says this, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. And don't nudge the person next to you on that, right? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Humility, everybody say humility. humility. Humility is esteemed in the kingdom of heaven. Not so much in the kingdom of America. Warren Wearsby, the theologian, he writes this, poor in spirit is the opposite of the world's attitude of self-praise and self-assertion. It's not a false sense of humility that says I'm not worth anything and I can't do anything. It's honesty with ourselves. We know ourselves, accept ourselves, and try to be ourselves to the glory of God. Understand this, in the, the world in which we, you know, the, the selfie world in which we, we crave likes and comments and shares, like we, we crave that when, when you get this little notification, who loves the notification, right? You're, you're not raising your hand, but I know you do, right? Like, like we're all wired for that. And, and, and we love like being praised and told how amazing we are in the kingdom of heaven. It is humility that is exalted. And I think we could give verse after verse after verse that showcases Jesus living this way, right? Exalting other people. And I wonder today if this is like, like red alert, red alert, red alert. I'm not living with humility in my life. I'm not poor in spirit. Right? One value system wants you to gain credibility on what you have done. The kingdom value, systems wants you, value system wants you to gain credibility on what God has done. We're poor in spirit. All right, the second one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, when I read this, that seems odd to me, Right? Blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. That word bl bless, by the way, that word bless can easily be translated happy, right? It's the same word. You could easily translate this passage, happy are those that mourn. And you're like, nope, nope, that doesn't make any sense, right? Theologians speak of two different types of mourning, all right? The first one would be natural mourning. It's probably what you're thinking of, right? It's, it's grieving the loss. It's despair. It's overwhelm. It's deep, deep sadness, right? And, and if we were to, call, to, to raise hands, like, we know this feeling. But, but all throughout Scripture, there's a, a picture of being comforted from this. Right? If you've ever read Psalm 23, if you're in a season of grief, I want you to write down a couple of things. Psalm 23, right? It's this picture of, of God being with you in the valley of the shadow of death. Life can't get any worse, but He's there. Comfort is possible. Right? In Psalm 46, it's this picture of chaos. Raise your hand if your life's ever been chaos. Who man. Psalm 46 tells you there's hope weaving its way in the midst of your chaos. You read through Revelation, and there's this picture of, uh, of, of what we just read, of the, 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 one, the reality that one day we'll be singing praises face to face with Jesus, and there'll be no more tears, no more crying, no more weeping. This picture of from natural mourning, comfort is possible the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of God.
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But there's another type of mourning that theologians speak of. And it's spiritual mourning. Everybody say spiritual mourning. Spiritual mourning. Now, when you think spiritual mourning, if you, you, you know kind of uh, some different stories of Jesus, think about, like, picture the image of Jesus coming to Jerusalem as he's preparing to be uh, crucified, seeing Jerusalem from a distance and beginning to weep. Right? He's weeping because of the sin. Right? A spiritual mourning is, is, is mourning our own sin. It's refusing to be proud and make light of our own sin. It's when we stop cracking jokes about what we do and, oh, can't help myself, and instead taking this very, very seriously, mourning the weight of our sin. We mourn the way we have talked to our spouse. We mourn the way we've abandoned our convictions. We mourn the unethical business decisions we've made in the past. We mourn what we've done in private. We mourn our sin, and we mourn the sins of our nation. We're not, we're not condemning and angry and frustrated and ah! No, we're, we're grieving. We're grieving the sin that is all around us and the culture that is changing so rapidly. But notice the, the posture difference. One celebrates, do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody. Right? So give in, do whatever you want, be happy. Right? It's your own life, it's your own body, do whatever you want. And the other one, calls us to mourn anything that goes against the ways of God. These are so different. And this feels so normal. And this feels so odd. But this is the call of the disciple, to mourn our sin. And if we're here today, there's like those that mourn, they're comforted. If we're mourning our sin and grieving the things that we've done, remember, there's comfort that comes. In the kingdom of heaven, we don't have to sit in this morning and stay in this morning. There's comfort that comes. And it's by the grace and, and blood of Jesus Christ, amen? The forgiveness is possible. So if you're here and you're grieving your sin and you're, you're overwhelmed with what you've done, I want to remind you something you probably already know. Forgiveness is possible. Comfort can go- come to those who mourn. The third one, one of my favorite ones right here. Blessed are the meek. Everybody say meek. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Okay, so when you read this, that sure doesn't sound very American, right? Because it sounds like weak. Blessed are the meek sounds like blessed are the weak, and we're, we're, we're not really a big fan of this. But to understand, to, to bring this word alive, you've got to understand the original Greek language. This word that's presented is the word Praus, P-R-A-U-S, Praus. And while it does mean humble and gentle, maybe what you're picturing when it comes to meek, it's a picture of constrained or controlled passion. Constrained or controlled passion. All right, now I love this. Some of you, if you're like history nerds like I can be, like I love this stuff. Um, This was a word, and you can Google this. You can look this up yourself. I'm not making this up. Um, I make up some stuff, but not this. Um, (laughs) This word is used, this word praus, is used to describe, a, from, from ancient Greece, a wild horse becoming a war horse. Okay, so back in the day, long, long ago, in ancient Greece, they would, they would go through the hills, they would go through the area to try to find wild horses to tame for their army, right? They would do this, and so they would gather these wild horses, and, and, and they would begin to train them, or what we would call break them, right? They begin to, to train these horses, and and eventually, you would see that they would put these horses into different categories, right? Those that were just like, there's no hope with this horse. They would, they would do away with some horses that you could train a little bit. Uh, they would be, be common use, you know, used around the city, used to, to carry things, just common use. But the best of the best, the horses that, that could be incredibly, incredibly trained were, would become war horses. And when they could condition themselves to be, be bridled like passion, they would be what's called in, the, in the, the mode of prous. They would be considered prous. Right? See, prous doesn't mean that, that all of a sudden these horses weren't powerful. They were incredibly powerful. It doesn't mean there wasn't passion there. Oh, there was passion. It was finely disciplined. And this is what it means to be meek. Right? Because my guess is you got some opinions. Anybody got any opinions? Woo, 
me and we got some opinions. We got some things to say. We got some things that we believe, and maybe we believe them very passionately. And when we see certain things on TV, it just stirs up all different emotions in us. Or maybe in our homes, it's mass chaos, and so we're just spewing things and, and yelling all the time. And in the kingdom of heaven, meekness is esteemed. Controlled, self-disciplined passion. Right? A, a, a quote that I want to read. It says, a war, her, a war horse learn to bring that nature under control. It would now respond to the slightest touch of the rider, stand in the face of the cannon fire, thunder into battle, and stop at a whisper. It was now meek. The meek are those that have opinions, have passions, and strong wills, but it's under control. A, a passage I want to read that, that describes Jesus uh, this way. Uh, this is in, uh, actually, this is Paul talking that describes how we're, we're supposed to live. Titus 3, 1 and 2. It says this. Remind them to be submissive to rulers. Already we're like, ooh, I don't like that. I want this, right? We, we don't like what you just said. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show, this is the word praus, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Oh, man, this is a little distant in our world today, right? This is like the opposite of this value system right here. To have, have opinions. You, you got opinions, but they're finely controlled. They're finely disciplined. Meekness is one of Jesus' greatest uh, uh, different characteristics that he shows in the New Testament. In the passage, the same passage where Jesus is, is overlooking Jerusalem, it describes him as meek, as prous. Right? Like, like passion controlled. Meekness brings the wild, chaotic life under strict control. You have things that make you angry. So do I. You have things that you're passionate about. Oh, so do I. You have opinions and beliefs. But Jesus is telling us in the kingdom of heaven, what he esteems, what he considers blessed, what causes happiness in our life is when we handle these things with meekness. We discern when to say something and when not to say something. We don't just spew hatred at everybody that disagrees with us. Instead, we're disciplined. It's passion controlled. Think about how this would influence your, your, your household. And I know you're thinking of the other person or you're thinking of the child. What about you? What about me? Like, how would this, this impact my home? If it was passion, I have passion, but it was disciplined and it was controlled. Number four. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. All right? Now, this one, this one must be wrong, because you and I, we hunger and thirst for a lot of things, and very rarely is it righteousness. What we tend to hunger and thirst for are things, right? Success, right? Like buying new things, buying new, new devices, buying bigger homes and nicer cars. Like This seems to be the American pursuit, right? The American dream, meritocracy, work your way up. Be in that pursuit to where one day you can just be like, ah, look at all that I have. Look at my kingdom that I've created, right? And then you die and it's all for nothing, right? This is the world that we live in, right? This is the reality. This seems so backwards. What happens when you, you buy a new phone? What happens a year or two later? You want a what? You want a new phone. If you buy a beautiful home, what happens in like the five, maybe 10 year window? You start to think, I wonder if I could afford a little better, a little more, a little, little, little nicer. This is the, the normal world we live in. All of us, all of us can easily relate to this. And Jesus is turning this upside down, this constant pursuit that we're on of more, 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 nicer, nicer, nicer. He's telling us, to pursue this, this hunger and thirst for righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. righteousness. Now, when I hear the word righteousness, I immediately think of like morality or like being good, right? Like hunger and thirst for being good. That's kind of how I've always understood righteous, but, but that's not what this word means at all, right? The Greek word is dikaiosu, Right? And I'm just making up like I know how to say that, but that's, that's how it is, dikaiosu. 
which means equity, justice, or to be made right. It's a picture of pursuing a world in which things are made right. And if you pay attention, both of these lists have that. They both have the idea of equality, justice, right? Those are, those are key terms that we hear. And, and just saying the word justice, you're like, well, where's he going with this? Right? Like, like this is our reality. But understand this. It's pursuing a world. It's hungering and thirsting for a righteousness, an equality that is in the will of God, not the will of the individual. It's pursuing God's ways, making it right according to him, not making it right according to us. And this is the pursuit of the disciple. It's fighting for the oppressed, caring for those that are down and out, and pursuing God's standard of justice and equality. This is the value system of the kingdom of heaven, pursuing, hungering, and thirsting for righteousness. How often do we do this? How often will we be described as hungering and thirsting for the welfare of somebody else? Not very often, maybe. Now, if it's hungering and thirsting for for things, we got that one down. But this is a call to, to live outside of yourself. This is a call to start thinking about other people and their well-being. Right? Start esteeming others above your own self and, 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 and looking at, at righteousness and justice and equality for others. This is an important thing that we must understand. Number five, we'll go through this one quick. Blessed are the merciful. Everybody say merciful. merciful. For they will be shown mercy. Now, we read this one, and, and I think we know this. Like, I think we would agree, okay, Jesus probably liked the whole idea of mercy, but it's hard for us because we want to give people what they got coming, right? You ever been wronged in life? What well, sounds amazing? Sweet vengeance. Sounds glorious, right? But we've been called to be merciful. And that's, that's so not this. Called to be merciful. I mean, when we think merciful, like if I'm just going to be merciful, when we think mercy, it's like, like not giving somebody what they deserve, right? Well, then I'm just going to be a doormat. I'm just going to be walked on. And so I'm not, not a real big fan of, of being merciful. No, they should get what they have coming. And the value system of the kingdom of heaven tells us, oh, I don't think you want that for yourself. Oh, I don't think you want that. We're merciful because he is mercy. We're merciful to others because he has constantly showed us mercy in our own life. It says this in Psalm 103, 8 and 10. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. Some of us, I, I want to pause just for a second. I want to get our attention and make sure we're hearing this because some of us, this is all you need to hear today. You can block out everything that I say. Some of us just need to be reminded of how good God is. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. You thankful for that? The kingdom values lead us to showing mercy because he has shown us mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Number six, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Now this one's a big one to me. Uh, this is a big one in, in the world that we live in. The world that we live in tells us to, to do whatever you want. And when it comes to the idea of, of purity, of morality, just do whatever you want, man. Just, just experiment, lust, give in to, to all these different cravings that you have within you. Right? This is a normal thing. In fact, it's, it's encouraged in our world. The idea of, of not pursuing that seems odd to our world. Yet the kingdom values are upside down. Jesus points us to a pure heart, one not defiled by the norms of our world. This summer, I have my 20-year high school reunion, okay? Now, when I say that, I'm well aware that instantly divides our crowd. Some of you are like, man, he's young, 20 years, my word. And then some of you are probably over here like, wow, he's old. He is really, really old. I get that. I'm, that, that that's that weird age of like, like some, like he's just a pup, right? And, and others like, golly, he's just older than I thought he was. It's kind of disturbing. 20-year um, anniversary, 20 20-year 20 year reunion. And the plan for my 20-year reunion is um, a goal where everybody gets drunk and sees what happens. That's basically the plan. 
That's the plan. And that's not my scene, right? And you're thinking like, it'd be weird if it was, Matt. It'd be kind of <laughs> weird. It'd be kind of weird if that was your scene. That's not my scene. Um, but let me tell you, it's not because they're bad people. No, they're, they're good people. They care about others. They're, they're pleasant to be around, or at least some of them are, right? Some of them weren't, right? Oh, I have no desire to see half that crew, right? But it's not because they're, they're terrible people. It's because this pursuit of, of being pure in heart is so odd to our world. It's so different. Seems archaic. Seems weird. Like, why? Why would we do this? And Jesus is gathering his disciples and he's saying, like, like blessed are the pure in heart, those that care about what's on the inside, for they will see God. Now, we, I want to draw your attention to that part. They will see God. This is crucial, all right? Now, we read this. When we're reading the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, and blah, blah, blah. We keep going. Pause for a second. Because in the ancient Jewish culture that is hearing this, that was shocking news that was just said. They will see God. You remember our study earlier this year, or I guess it was uh, the end of 2022, remember our study in, in uh, Exodus and Leviticus? Remember when we talked about the tabernacle and the high priest? We had all those images up on the stage. Um, remember the, the area, the holy of holies, right? Or the most holy place. This was a place that only the high priest, everybody say high priest. high priest. Only the high priest could go into this holy of holies where the presence of God was. But he could only go in if he was ritually pure. And ritually pure basically meant that he hadn't touched gross things. He hadn't touched blood or, or dead animals or, or body fluids of some type. Like, like he hasn't touched these things. And if he has, let's, let's ritually pur you know, purify him and then he can go in. The high priest gets to experience God. And that's it. And only if he's ritually pure. And Jesus just turned this upside down. I can only imagine the, the audience of the first century almost gasping at what he just said. The pure in heart, for they will see God. But notice, if the, the focus of the high priest was like external, right? Oh, I've touched something I shouldn't. What's the focus of Jesus? The internal. He's telling us, Focus on the inside way more than you focus on the outside. And my guess is we can all easily lean towards focusing on the outside. He's turning this upside down to focus on the inside. Worry less about the version of you that everybody sees and worry more about the version of you that only God knows. When it comes to this, this specific beatitude, my mind is drawn to um, an epidemic in our church. It's not unique to our church. It's, it's commonplace. Um, it's an epidemic that causes us to look completely fine on the outside, but rotting on the inside. I, I, I did a bunch of uh, studying, and I found that stats show, depending on the stats, it's, a, it's kind of a wide range, and so I'm just going to kind of give you that range. 70 to 95% of men look at pornography. Surprising to some, not surprising to most. One study found that 73% of women ages 18 to 35 do the same thing. Those are alarming percentages, right? 70 to 95 or 73%. And I've had enough conversations to know here at Oak Hills Church, like, like these stats are pretty accurate. This is a normal thing in our life. In fact, uh, I was telling Valerie last night, I was, I was looking up uh, some of those stats, and I just I stumbled upon an article, which is always a dangerous thing when you write the word pornography on your Google search. I don't advise you to do that. Uh, but luckily, safe searches on all that sort of stuff. But there was one article. It was talking about the 73% uh, for women, but it was kind of in, in the, general, the general topic. It was like, this is too low. It should be higher than this. And, and it was, this article was spurring us on to more of this. This should be more normal in our life. And here Jesus is like turning this upside down. 
And for those of you that are part of Oak Hills Church, and this is your struggle, those of you that are here and, and I talk about, like, if you got a sin that you need to repent, like, that's the sin? And every time it's like the same thing you're thinking of? Those of you that are in that fight, I want to tell you the fight is worth it. Those of you, we have people in this church that are, are going to counseling because of it, trying to, Right? They're, they're trying to bear that fruit. They're going to cling to Jesus through counseling. Some of us have high levels of accountability. There are multiple individuals that I, see, I get to, to see. I'm blessed to be in a spot in your life that I get to see your covenant eyes report every day. And I want to tell you, those of you that are, are trying to, to fight this, God bless you. It is worth it. Because what's the result of pure in heart? What do they get to do? They get to see God. And remember, your, God's grace is sufficient for you. His forgiveness is so much more powerful than your offense. Just rest in the goodness of God. Cling to him. Make those steps that so many of you are making. But this is a very real thing. And I want to tell you, if that's your struggle, don't be ashamed of it. Don't hide in the dark. It's scary. Shine a light on it. You shine a light on it, and I promise you something, this is weird. There really is hope. There really is. This doesn't have to consume you. This doesn't have to train wreck your relationships. It doesn't have to be uh, to cause you to be constantly on edge. There is hope. Shine a light on it. It's a normal thing, and it's, uh, it's a normal thing in our culture. But it's something that as Oak Hills Church individuals, attenders, and members, we must be passionate about fighting against. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Number seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now, I read this, we all value peace, right? Every one of us values peace. Like, oh, the, the white sand beaches sound amazing right now, don't they? Ah, oh, cabin in the woods with just the sound of the birds. Oh, sounds so good right now. Some of you like just, just a lazy Sunday afternoon. You just can't wait. You got nothing planned. Some of you sleeping in. Oh, it sounds good. We love peace. But what's valued in the kingdom of heaven? Peacemakers. Not, not peace. It's peacemakers. Did you catch the difference? One values experiencing it. One values bringing it. And maybe today you find yourself in a situation or two that, that peace seems absent, seems so, so distant. The person at work is being rude to you. Raise your hand if you've ever had that happen. Ugh. I, it's not, I, I'm not raising my hand, Brian, I promise. <laughs> All right. A family member is being a problem. A spouse has changed, and they're not the person you married. Peace escapes you. Yet here with the seventh beatitude, Jesus has gathered his disciples and he's saying, blessed are the peacemakers. And not to spend too much time on this, this one particular, each one of these could obviously be their own sermon. But this idea of peace, in my home, in the Matt Wheeler household, the peace, or lack thereof when I say the words bedtime, <laughs> but the peace falls on me. I bring peace. The peace. Peace with those I struggle with doesn't fall on them. It falls on me. I'm to be a peacemaker. Peace with those that have wronged me it falls on me. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so just saying that, I don't know what stirs in your mind. Some of you are like, Matt, you don't understand. You don't know my situation. Maybe I don't. But I do know that Jesus just said, blessed are the peacemakers. We all want peace in the kingdom of heaven. What is valued amongst the disciples is making that peace. And so I just want to encourage you to think through and pray through ways, maybe seek counsel, seek guidance on ways that, that you can bring the peace in your strained situation. I'm not trying to, to minimize your situation. Some of you have some things going on. Some of us, this is easy. Some of us, this is, this is deep-rooted and this is overwhelming. But I want to encourage you, it's worth it. Blessed are the peacemakers. 
but they'll be called sons or daughters of God. And the last one, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, you will be blessed when you're made fun of, when you're belittled, somebody's cracking a joke about your faith, somebody raises an eyebrow like, you really think that? You really believe that? Somebody calls you a name for pursuing a life of morality. In the kingdom of heaven, you're considered blessed. And why? Like, don't miss this. Those that are persecuted, even, even like the ultimate price that we talked about uh, in, in weeks past, the ultimate price of, of giving my life for Jesus, you're considered blessed. For great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets that came before you. So if, here, if you're in this situation and, and, and you're, you're being made fun of, you're being belittled, you're being called this, called that, or, or maybe you're just being frustrated when you see different comments on different posts and it just, it's making you mad because you're seeing things that are just attacking your belief system. And maybe you do have, have that, that, that discipline of meekness and you're not typing back and doing all these things. Maybe you do, but it doesn't mean it's not affecting you. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. American values, says the State Department, and kingdom values, says Jesus. If we're going to be honest, in many ways, the kingdom values do sound weird. They sound foreign. This one feels way more natural, easy. This is what we hear on the news. This is what we experience on social media, right? all these different things that, that we talked about. This is normal for us. But Jesus is calling the disciple to an upside-down value system. Completely different. In the midst of living in this culture, he's calling us to this value system. And if you think about it, it's this value system that's going to give us a seat at the table with the lost. Think about it. This value system we all have strong opinions on. This is the value system that you see on the news and, and, and you see everywhere that, that we're championing, we're upset and we're angry. This is the value system that easily divides because we have different interpretations of what these things mean. In this value system, we all actually crave. Who doesn't want to be around somebody that's humble? Who doesn't want to spend time with somebody that's merciful and a peacemaker? Somebody that actually thinks before they talk. That's a novel idea. Each one of us. And notice, like, like it's not just Christians that want to be around that. Non-Christians want to be around that too. This is the one that gives you a seat at the table at your job. This is the one that gives you a seat at the table in your hallways at school. This is the one that gives you a seat at the table at that, that uh, family member that's living opposed to the gospel. It's the kingdom values. Now, we tend to gather around, and what do we talk about? We talk about these values, and we get in circles that reinforce these values, and we just get more mad at the circles that don't enforce the same, and don't interpret these the same way. And it's almost like Jesus is telling us you want to be blessed? You want to be happy? This is the value system. So may we be spurred to pursue a new kind of value system. That's our action step for the day. May you pursue humility, mourn your sin, lead with meekness, hunger and thirst for righteousness, show mercy, pursue a pure heart, be a peacemaker and endure persecution. And when you do, you will be blessed. You will be happy. In an upside-down way, the kingdom, the kingdom values bring a happiness, bring a blessedness to our life. Way more than these ever could. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we come to you, and we just see these two value systems side by side, and, and we confess we're drawn to one. We easily are drawn to the American values. God, forgive us when we're off. Help us to draw back into the kingdom values, the values that, that you desire that the disciple has. God, as we're, we're looking at all these things, I pray that you draw our attention to a specific thing that maybe you're needing us to, to reshape and to remold. Church family, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, 
I want to go through these again. And I want you to simply raise your hand if one of these is applying to you in maybe more ways than one. I want you to raise your hand if, if this is an issue that you know that God is trying to get your attention with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By a raise of hands, anybody that, that you fi- feel and you, you know that God is calling you to pursue a life of humility, exalting other people ahead of yourself. I see hands. Let's keep going. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's, he's calling us to mourn our sin. If anyone is in here and we haven't been mourning our sin, and today he's calling us to mourn our sin, and we're, we're called to experience that comfort that comes with his grace, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to draw attention to you. Stop making light of our sin. I see hands all over the place. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He's calling us to bridle that tongue, to have passions, but have self-discipline, to to control that. Raise your hand. That's nearly all over the place, church. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Raise your hand if he's he's calling you to pursue the well-being of somebody else, to champion somebody else besides ourselves. See, hands all over the place. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, this one's going to be hard if God's calling you to raise your hand on this, but there's a situation in your life that he is calling you to show mercy in. I want you to raise your hand if that's you today. See hands all over the place. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, this one's where we get personal, right? Like, we don't want to admit this, but, but let's, let's just raise our hands. Let's, even as our eyes are closed, it's some way to shine a light on our reality if we're not pursuing a life of being pure in heart. And he's calling us. He's trying to get our attention. Pursue this life of purity of heart. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. See, hands all over the place. Hands all over the place. Blessed are the peacemakers. Today, he's calling you to bring the peace. If there's a situation that's coming to your mind, he's trying to speak to you in a specific way, I want you to raise your hand. Be the peacemaker in that situation. And finally, blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness. If you're struggling because somebody's making fun of you, belittling you, or things you're simply reading online, you're struggling, you simply raise your hand. Blessed are the persecuted hands. Father, we come to you and we're thankful that we get moments in the day to just center ourselves back on you. So may we focus in on you. May we lean towards these values. We thank you so much for what you've done for us. We thank you for the forgiveness that is possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. And in response to that that blessing and that gift, may we begin to shift and mold our lives to look, look more like your values. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together in worship.
I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. The light of the world forever reigns. You are more. to the screens. A culture is growing, a mission is advancing. The sanctuary is filling, the ministry is expanding, and lives are being changed by the hope found in Jesus. And with this renewed sense of momentum comes a renewed sense of direction. Psalm 126 tells of how when God's people came out of difficult times, they were like those who dreamed. Their laughter was restored, their health brought back, and a sense of joy for what the future would bring came upon them. So together we start the Dream Campaign, a two-part campaign that will carry us into 2023 and beyond. Part one, we address our growing congregation. As we continue to hit specific attendance numbers, we are preparing to ultimately go to two services. This allows us to reach more people, 
double our capacity and enhance our Sunday morning discipleship efforts. Part two, we bring our facility to an entirely new level. With massive upgrades to our main building, we will position ourselves to multiply ministry efforts and allow our growing church to thrive. We'll be expanding the lounge to create more space for activities, events, and conversations. We'll be growing the foyer to improve first impressions and enhance our kids' check-in process. We will reconfigure our office spaces to provide a better environment for counseling sessions and meetings. We will be increasing the size of our children's church to address our future needs in the kids' ministry. And to top it all off, we're even paving our gravel parking lot. All of this so we can pursue the dream of reaching more, discipling more, and empowering more people to make a difference for Jesus. But in order to fulfill the dream, we need dream partners. We need people who will be like those who dream, from Psalm 126. We need people who see what others don't, who dream when others are held down by the past. Church family, we are becoming a church of passionate worship, intentional discipleship, invested volunteers, and overwhelming love for our community. So together, let's be like those who dream. The dream campaign in one word, I would say culture. Everybody say culture. Culture, and so Matt talked about in the video, we talk about it all the time, but we want a culture. A culture does not happen by accident. A culture must be created, right? It's what we allow to happen or what we decide to happen. And so we want to be intentional about all those things. You heard it, passionate worship, passionate worship, intentional discipleship, invested volunteers, and again, overwhelming love for our community. And all of that is coming to a very unique spot where we're here today to celebrate. You heard it in the video, but that day, it's not just improving the facilities to have culture we need room for growth so we can do all of those things we talk about. And that day has came. So mark your calendars. April the 9th. We had a debate this morning on what day of the week it was. But April the 9th is Easter Sunday. On Easter Sunday, our church, we're going to be officially going to two services. Let's give that a big round of applause. Now I'm telling you, culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's the famous quote. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. So we have the right culture. It's not about having all the training manuals and flow charts. It's about who we are as a body of believers. And so sometimes there's growing pains with two services, but our church has never been in this situation. Our church has never been a church that has tremendous momentum as we go to two services. In the past, we had to go to service because, two services because of the pandemic a few years ago. We did a, a two services previously years ago before I was even at the church uh, in an effort to kind of spur some growth. But this is not a desperation call. This is a, this is a very intentional decision our church is making. Because think about it. Here's what's incredible. We have a, a life track class coming up on 101 this Wednesday. And we encourage you guys to be at 101. If you've never been to 101 this Wednesday, it's happening. We encourage you to be here at 630. We also have a 201, a 301, and a 401. All these classes we try to squeeze in on a Wednesday night with everything else, and we'll do those sometimes on a Sunday evening. Well, those classes we can do now on Sunday mornings. So we have our, our kids volunteers that don't get a chance to be in here for worship. Well, now we have two services. They can, they can attend a worship service and also serve at a worship service. So not only are we doubling our capacity, we want invested volunteers, but the truth is, we don't have enough volunteer opportunities right now even to have people volunteer. And so this is allowing us to continue to grow in so many ways. We're so excited about all the things God is doing right here. So uh, other quick announcements before I forget that next Sunday, next Sunday is the last day. That is the deadline for your deposit for the El Salvador mission trip. So if you are planning on taking that mission trip to El Salvador, that $300 deposit is due next Sunday. So make sure you have that. And then also, our ladies have a Bible study coming up this week, which is on Thursday night. It is Thursday. Thursday night, ladies' Bible study. So the first Thursday of every month, the ladies get together for a Bible study here in the gym. And so we encourage you guys to join us on Wednesday for OHC 101, ladies' night for their Bible study on Thursday. Um, at this time, we're going to pray and we're going to bless the offering. If you want to give to Oak Hill Church or specifically the Dream Campaign, there's always three ways you can do it. You can text to give. Send the dollar amount to 84321. 
If it's for the dream campaign, just write the word dream right after the dollar amount. You can drop your offerings in the back, those black boxes as you exit the sanctuary, or you can always set up reoccurring donations and tithes through ohcedmond.com. But this time, join me as we pray and bless today's offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father. We thank you for such a strong message today from Pastor Matt as we're spurred along, Father, to, to, to really reflect on those Beatitudes, Father, and, and not succumb and not fold to the cultural pressures and what we should value, but let Christ be the center and focus of that. Let's use Scripture as our compass on how to guide us, not what the American society may be teaching us or what our employer is impressing upon us, Father, but ultimately what's written in your word. We thank you for today. Bless today's tithes and offerings that everything we can do, we do it to continue to spread the name of Jesus. And it's in your son's most amazing name we all pray. Amen. 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 As you stand up, don't forget, this Wednesday night, 630 is our OHC 101. We hope you join us for the new families. And as always, striving to be.